to co-organizer of this event uh, from uh, Euro Defense Romania, Professor Liviu Moreșan. Uh, Professor, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, I think that um, the main idea of uh, our uh, last two sessions must be resilience. We have an important number of participants still after so many hours of discussions. Mm -hmm. And it's a proof of uh, the fact that uh, people were interested and uh, we had uh, almost uh, all the time more than 100 people now we are around. So um, the topic is uh, EU and future of MENA. Uh, it was mentioned here by the previous speakers uh, uh, the interest uh, of um, of the region for European Union, and uh, we have to discover if also European Union has interest for the region. Uh, European Union is now uh, trying to play uh, a role, a geopolitical role. Or uh, this is a um, uh, quite complicated uh, approach. And, uh, we must be uh, in the field, uh, in the domain, in the area of Mediterranean area, Eastern uh, Mediterranean area. Uh, we must, uh, European Union must be much more active, present, and with solution and uh, supporting the dialogue for finding uh, as the best way uh, of, of uh, coming out of the crisis. We had the example of, of uh, failed state, uh, so-called failed state uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, a bijou of the region and, and those uh, excellent people I, I know also personally, but uh, the problems are also inside and outside uh, of this country. The European Union must uh, be present and uh, promote the dialogue and promote programs in the region. So let's see what is the reality uh, in the field. Uh, I mentioned to you that uh, Egmont uh, Foundation have uh, presented uh, recently uh, a report about, uh, uh, about this uh, region and the fact that uh, uh, something will, will happen. Um, it was in the title, it was mentioned calm before the storm in a core European strategic zone. So the uh, European Union must develop uh, a new vision in the field. And uh, we have to be confident that France, which will take the lead uh, in um, uh, which will take the lead in in um, uh, in the first of January. Uh, the French presidency will have a, a role to play. So, let's start with the first uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Ali Dawan Ekbali Zar. So, uh, Ambassador, uh, if you can bring the, the some personal opinions, some ideas, proposals, if it's possible to, to go straight to the point. Thank you so much. Ambassador Zach. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening from Tehran. Unisara to our friend in Bucharest and Salam Alaikum to our friend in uh, Islamic world. In the name of God. For a few minutes in the final stage of important one day conference, I am pleased to give a brief presentation to the esteemed participant, including academic leading people. The international arena in 2021 was witnessed rapid and important developments such as COVID-19 regional and international crisis in Afghanistan Syria, Yemen, Libya in the Middle East and North Africa, political instability in Latin America, and of course the escalation of nationalists and populists in the world, especially in Europe. All of this has had important and different effect on the world and 
world powers and others country. As you know, the big power, especially Europe has long paid attention to the Middle East. They have considered a wide range of political, economic, cultural, social and traditional features. There is currently no clear and convincing picture of relations between the country of the green continent and especially the EU member state with the most country of the Middle East. The attitude of major European government to, toward the Middle East, particularly those of France, Germany behind the Britain, as well as their support for US unilateral action in the region over the past two decades are unsatisfactory. If we look today at the occupation of Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and the conflict in Syria in the last two decades, we have to realize that despite spending billions of euros and losing many members of the armed forces, Europe has not achieved any significant result. Perhaps the surprise withdrawal of the United States without, the European, without consulting European partners from Afghanistan can teach Europe, European countries a good lesson. A fundamental question about the development of relations between Europe and Middle East is the double standard of Europe in dealing with the country of the region. And why one day they are friends with some country like, like Iran and the next day they showed negative approach as what we have seen in the uh, nuclear agreement. Or why did the United States see the fail to the triangle of its regional adversary, namely Russia, China, and Turkey? And the last question, and why does it pursue uncertain and confusing policies? Of course, in general, European countries have highlighted the Middle East in the following areas over the past two two centuries. First, energy. Europe has traditionally considered Iran and Middle East country as a stable, easy, and fast sources of uh, assuring needs of energy. Of course, by the end of the first decade of the third millennium, it has imported most energy from Iran. According to Eurostate, the EU's annual energy consumption is 830 million tons, of which nuclear energy is 28%, coal is 19%, gas is 18%, oil 12%, and 2% is renewable energy. Of course, Russia has carried out complex energy projects in Europe over the years, reducing the continent dependence on West Asian energy. And in that time, the US has an ambition to send gas in Europe. Second, consumer market. The European Union has always paid significant attention to the regional consumer market. With 7% of the world population and more than 20% of world trade, it is the world largest exporter and second largest importer. For instance, by the end of the first decade of the third millennium, trade between Iran and the European Union fell from 26.9 billion euros in 2012 to its lowest level at 6 billion euros last year. 80% of which was European export to Iran. Third, access to third market, the Middle East, particularly Iran, due to its geostrategic position is an ideal platform for access to market of more than 600 million people in 15 countries bordering Iran in the Persian Gulf, 
Central Asia and Caucasus. Four, attracting elite workforce and Iranian smart capital. Today, Europe needs experts more than ever. And since the early 20th century, we are witnessed an upward trend in the migration of young people and capital owner to Europe. The role of Middle East community, especially Iranians in many European countries in terms of job creation and services, especially healthcare is extraordinary and exemplary. Five, use of exclusive products. Some products of the region, such as handmade carpet, pistachio, caviar, petrochemical, and of course, Iranian shafran are well known and exceptional among Europeans. Six, another topic of discussion in the EU relation with the MENA is democratic values. In fact, if the union take the path of supporting the freedom movement in the region, that religion, religion democracy and the role of independent leader will emerge. As a conclusion, in general, the Middle East is extremely important for the EU because of issues such as energy, security, terrorism, the migration challenges, the old crisis between Palestine and Zionist regime, as well as the continuing process of ISIS in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and most recently in Afghanistan. However, the union has a soft passive and collective approach to crisis management and has been less able to play a major role in the Middle East conflict due to the diversity of interests and positions of its most important and influential countries, especially Germany, France, and Italy behind the UK. Finally, Europe needs a clear and realistic roadmap to maintain its long-term interest in relation with the Middle East, especially with Iran as a very important country in region. I believe, I believe the think tanks and intellectuals have an important role to play. I am sure that this one day meeting will have a great impact on this process. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Ambassador, and thank you to be optimistic uh, in this respect. Uh, it's right, uh, uh, we have uh, a role to play as, uh, as uh, NGOs. Uh, we have seen that uh, pandemia was uh, something which have uh, interrupted the normal activities also of the think tanks. But uh, we discovered today by this marathon of, uh, of uh, presentations and discussions about the topic of, of MENA that uh, uh, we can make best use of this online contact and uh, and uh, you are right that in the next future we have to continue our dialogue uh, and then to come with proposals and solutions for, for the problems. So, uh, Dr. Mihai Sebastian Kihaya, uh, he is a policy analyst with EPC, European Policy Center in Brussels, the capital of European Union. So. Dr. Kihaya, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. It's uh, it's a pleasure to to be here and attend these uh, these discussions. I think we already had uh, many many interesting points so far. So now maybe just to dwell even further in the EU Mena Mena relation, I'm going to try to give um, maybe rather a different uh, different perspective, and hopefully a more optimistic one. So obviously, when we discuss about the the Middle East and North Africa from a perspective of external actors. There are a few points that uh, that analysis cover. 
such as, for instance, for the United States, we see the, the new focus, the refocus towards, um, towards Asia, the five to Asia, we see less military engagement, more focused on, on diplomacy. When we talk about uh, Russia, we see military engagement, military presence, arms sales, and more partnerships. When we talk about China, for instance, we see more economic cooperation. We see China more present in areas where it has a competitive advantage, as uh, Robert, I think, pointed out a few panels uh, before. But when we talk about the EU, we, what we hear, what we see, what we understand is the EU is not influential, is not able to affect major development in the region. Well, I think when we talk about the EU engagement in the region, we need to look at different layers because there are many layers to cover. So for instance, of course, there is the EU MENA interactions in major political and security aspects, such as the EU actions in, for instance, the nuclear negotiations with Iran, the Middle East peace process and other conflicts in the region. At the same time, there are also other cooperation layers. There is, of course, trade, there are association agreements, there is assistance for develop development, there is humanitarian assistance, and there are different uh, regional cooperation aspects. So basically, I'm going to focus in the next few minutes on four things. Firstly, I'll try to outline what works in human cooperations, what are some of the success stories, what are the areas that work. Secondly, I will try to outline the areas where the EU could be more present, more influential, what are the possible areas of cooperation for future. Then thirdly, I will try to outline how the EU can do this or is already doing this or following these areas of, of engagement. And last, I'll try to point out some issues that are important to follow in uh, 2022 and, and beyond. So going backwards, what actually works in the EU-MENA cooperation? Well, firstly, I would say that there, there's a series of regional cooperation projects that are that we mostly see in the EU Southern Neighborhood Cooperation. You know, the Southern Neighborhood composing of countries from, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from North Africa and um, the Levant. So basically, these regional cooperation projects with the Southern Neighborhood countries focus on multiple, uh, multiple areas, such as migration, judicial cooperation, civil society, culture, transport, growth, youth, and so on and so forth. So forward. It's true that uh, these projects are rather low when you look at the, their budgets, on, when you look maybe at their level of interaction, which is much, much lower than major political and security issues where the EU is involved. But they're nevertheless very important. For instance, just as a, as a figure from 2014 to 2020, you invested over 800 million euros in these uh, projects. And just a few examples, we can look at Euromed Justice or Euromed Police, which cover the police and judicial cooperation with the Southern neighborhood. And of course, we have the development assistance and, the, and also support during the COVID-19. And this support, I think in the past almost two years, there are over 2.3 billion uh, euros, if I recall correctly, towards the countries of the Southern neighborhood. And then, of course, there is also the bilateral project that the EU develops with countries from the Middle East and North Africa. And this uh, project covers subtopics such as economic growth, institution building, anti-money laundering, countering the funding of terrorists for terrorists. Then, of course, civil protection, which is also very important, as we'll see later, border security, aviation security. And there are many examples where the EU helped the um, Middle East and North Africa, Africa countries. Well, what these activities uh, outline. They of course outline an exchange of know-how the EU gives to the, the Middle East and North Africa countries. There are some lessons learned that the EU draws back and also makes the EU a um, trustworthy partner. Moving on to the second point, it outlines the areas where the EU could be more influential. And here I, I would look at maybe the challenges and opportunities Communities that the, the region faces. And here, the first one, I would say it's climate change, without a doubt. We see the temperature rising in the, in the region. We see uh, droughts. We see issues of water scarcity. We, we see the potential for natural disasters. We, we see a reduced food supply. Many of the countries in the region, they import a big amount of their food. So any disruption in the supply chain would affect them or already has. And also, in addition to this, I will look at the digitalization of the region, which is advancing very rapidly. The COVID-19 has also enhanced this process. And also with this digitalization process, we see a growing number of cyber threats in the region. 
in terms of, uh, of opportunities, I would look at energy transition. The, the region has an immense potential for renewable energy. And I'm talking about uh, solar, potential, also wind potential, and here the EU could enhance its cooperation as outlined in the next point. And third, I would uh, outline the maritime issues in the regions. We have like a high amount of, of traffic, there is an important amount of supply chain passing through the region where the EU could be more influential. Moving on to the third point, which I'll, I'll focus here, how the EU can, uh, can operationalize these uh, these aspects where one of them is the the new agenda for the mediterranean that the eu launched in february this year and it outlines a few priorities in the next years in growth business investments uh, green transition and digital transition of course it's important to follow in the next year the implementation in this uh, in this regard then we have the EU cybersecurity strategy which, which outlines how important it is to establish partnerships with different Actors across the world and the Middle East and North Africa, it's an important part of this external cooperation. Then going back to the energy transition, the EU has developed the EU Green Deal, which doesn't have yet an external dimension, but there is a lot of potential to develop this external dim dimension and look at how the EU and the Middle East and North Africa could cooperate in this energy transition. Then third, there is the maritime presence. The EU is already present in the Strait of Hormuz. There's the, the, the mission, the EMASOF, but there is potential to have more presence in the region. And I think it's important for the EU, the EU to do, develop more tools to be present from a maritime point of view. And fourth, I would look at the EU um, Gulf relations. We have had recently the visit of the high representative for, for foreign affairs in the region. He, his trip was to reinforce ties. And among the points in this trip, of course, renewable energy, because um, the renewable energy produced by the Gulf will need the market. And of course, they would look at the EU as an immediate um, Client, of course, water security, civil protection cooperation, maritime safety, nuclear safety, and also the possibility to relaunch discussions on a EU GCC free trade agreement, which are currently stuck or have been for quite a few years. And last, another tool of the EU is the EU Global Getaway. I think it was mentioned today also in some of the introductory remarks of the conference. It's a new tool that was just launched, I think, around 300 billion for the next uh, uh, five years, if I recall correctly, and its aim is to support developing infrastructure in the developing world, which also includes the Middle East and North Africa region. And I think it's important to follow also in these developments. Now, moving before moving to the last point, I would say that this operation in, in all these areas could act as confidence building measures. And by building this confidence, then the EU could become more influential in more important Politically, from a political and security point of view issues. Now, uh, last point, issues to follow in, uh, in the next year and also beyond that I think that are very important. Just a bit zooming out a bit on the region. And I think there are like a, a couple of points. One would be the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, especially Red Sea. This would grow in importance in the following years. And I think it's important for the EU to adapt and understand what this development means from a trade, security, and economic point of view. Then there is the EU potential role in the reconfigurations that happen in the region. We have, we have seen in the past year and or two, we have seen warming relations between countries that have easily been at odds with each other. We've seen, of course, Iran and the Gulf, we see the Gulf and Turkey, we see Turkey and Egypt, and I think it's important for the EU to, to, to be present in these discussions and to, to have an active role. Then we have the East Mediterranean geopolitical competition. This will grow without a doubt in the next years, and the EU needs probably to develop a strategy and also some actions towards the region. Then I would look also at the spillover from Sahel towards North, North Africa. I, I think it's, uh, it's important to look at uh, Sahel also from the, from the prism of the lessons learned from Afghanistan. There are many similarities, and I think it's important for the EU look at the at the region through the lenses of the lessons that we learned from Afghanistan. And of course, the lessons learned from Afghanistan are also important for the future EU interaction with the region. And the last point would be the, the French uh, EU presidency next year. The French are, are starting to become more prominent in the region and it's important to follow how will this develop in the, in the next year. And I'll just stop here. Thank you.
Yes, we have not to stop. We have to continue the discussion because it's a it's a topic, a sensitive one. Uh, the role, the chance of European Union uh, in cooperation with uh, the MENA region. So the next speaker, Professor Marius Nakshu, University of Economic Studies in Bucharest. Uh, he is the leader of a, a very uh, representative uh, course on, on uh, geopolitics, launching uh, also a book uh, recently about uh, the topics of geopolitics. And we are very pleased that he is now with us. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, if uh, all the technical aspects are right, if you hear me and see my slides, Yes. It's okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have to congratulate you uh, for your resistance and resilience, and also all the participants and uh, your uh, co-chairman. I have to confess here uh, there was a marathon, an academic and also a diplomatic uh, marathon. It is the first time when I participate, when I join um, such a um, professional uh, marathon. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my name is Marius Nakshu, and I, um, I, uh, I am associate professor within the Bucharest Academy of Economic Studies. And okay, I coordinate um, MA, a master program in geopolitics and uh, business. And my presentation will be um, a little bit broader uh, than the issue of the panel. And it is about um, perspective uh, regarding uh, of uh, these 30 years since the cold, since the end of the cold war and uh, how the world is um, is changing. Um, I'm interested in uh, if uh, ah, okay. I'm interested in the instrument that has been used um, and the context because this is important. This is I uh, analyzed. I'm analyzing for uh, many many years um, and. Um, it's important to me to emphasize that uh, this uh, dynamics of geopolitical frontier between uh, the Western world, and when I say Western world, I refer to the NATO and the uh, European Union and Russia. Everything is happened is happening in uh, this region. Our consequences, our effects on this on uh, these dynamics of this geopolitical uh, frontier. Um, also, we have new actors. We uh, face uh, with a um, new space race, with uh, strange, bizarre actors who believed a few years ago that Arab state could, became, uh, could become um, space actors. Also, there is another um, environment for geopolitics and also became a geopolitical uh, weapon, the cyberspace. So synthesizing this, uh, we have to, uh, we um, have a changing world and we have, we need new instruments, new tools for understanding. So from my point of view, there are at least three instruments that uh, has been used, especially by Russia, uh, for solving these uh, dynamics of geopolitical frontier between Western world and uh, Russia. A frozen conflict, uh, and Russia knows how to export the geopolitical uh, model of Transnistria as a frozen conflict. Hard energy, another term, another specialized term, energetic, uh, with the K at, at um, the last word, the last uh, letter, 
or hard energy, gas, natural gas versus geopolitical concessions. And also I used here another, um, probably a strange word, Euro Intifada. What happening, what is happening with uh, those uh, human bombs as the Polish uh, Belarus border, uh, it's a sort of Euro Intifada. Refugees and migrants are used as a geopolitical tool. Regarding the first, uh, um, the first instrument, Russia used this uh, frozen conflict in order to step in the first uh, in the first stage for breaking the ongoing geopolitical trends, and those geopolitical trends were the extension, the march to the east of the NATO and European Union. Then. Uh, uh, this instrument was used by Russia to create artificial geopolitical uh, tension. If we look at the maps, uh, all these frozen conflicts are located on this frontier, on this geopolitical frontier between Russia and the Western world. A frontier, it is not a political border. A frontier, uh, a geopolitical frontier is um, a sort of buffer zone. It's a sort of buffer zone, and we have uh, here some uh, uh, some terms. Um, from my point of view, the geopolitical Transnistria, I already said that um, Transnistria became a, a model of uh, the evolution of all uh, frozen conflict of the area, is a region of high geostrategic significance used by Russia for uh, stabilizing the geopolitical frontier on Baltic Black Sea alignment. Uh, a century ago, a Romanian geographer, Simeon Mehedin, in a conference like ours, uh, um, tried to establish that the border between Asia, the geographical border between Asia and Europe must be on this alignment. Uh, Baltic Sea and Black Sea. If we observe, observe the phenomenology today, the currently phenomenology is in the same place on this alignment between uh, Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. The second instrument was uh, about energy. Hard energy is a translation from hard power, from hard power to hard energy. But uh, the army invasion was replaced with um, locking the gas pipeline. First was a gas war between Ukraine and Russia in the 2000 years. And this gas war uh, generated, stimulated another conflict a conflict uh, regarding the gas pipelines. And the Russia used uh, what we can call um, preemptive gas pipeline. If um, George Bush um, Jr. used the term uh, preemptive war, sometimes um, uh, translating a wrong tra uh, uh, in a wrong translation in Romanian as preventive war, uh, Mr. Putin, Mr. Vladimir Putin, the President Vladimir Putin uses another concept and this is preemptive gas pipeline. He launched some project blocked in the Western <laughs> Uh, if we look at the reality nowadays, we have a, an energy pincer. We have four uh, gas pipeline under the Baltic Sea. We have the gas pipeline under the Black Sea. And the reality was a Russian reality, an energy pincer uh, which uh, catch Europe. The third instrument and the last instrument, uh, chronologically speaking, is this um, uh, new geopolitical tool 
the use of refugees and emigrants. Um, we easily can observe that we are in the same place, in the same location on the geopolitical frontier between Western world and Russia, between NATO and European Union and uh, Russia. After 30 years, it seems we return back to the walls and fences, and there are some fences, physical fences, physical walls um, uh, rising between Western and uh, Russia. This is another interesting term, economic, economic refugees. We all, we all know that um, uh, emigrants uh, is economical, has economical purpose. We all know that refugees has political purpose, but we have, uh, we face another concept, uh, refugees where the push factor is political from Syria, from Iraq and another um, war zone, but they choose where to go. They have economical reasons. They all uh, have to uh, get in Germany, for an example. Uh, this is a, um, a map which show the population growth and the difference between Southern world and the Northern world. It uh, looks like, um, thermodynamical uh, equilibrium, the northern world uh, is um, demographically aging and um, most of the people uh, came from the south, the southern world, were from the emerging economies. If we look at the 2020 uh, and 21 refugees, they come from Iraq, mostly, Afghanistan, and Syria. Um, why Belarus? Because that's why I explain, uh, this is not uh, about the simple migration route. This is about the geopolitical instrument. Uh, they were uh, brought here with the National Airlines company to put pressure on um, European Union uh, border. Okay, yeah. And you keep on the block, tourism in Belarus. They also share the location. They all came in the same spot. And that uh, means we have another, um, infor we have the hybrid uh, conflict. We have the informational uh, component. Well, in another presentation, if uh, we consider the Belt and Road Initiative, is this another answer on Eurasia? This is a question, a further question, an open question, which could affect the relation between European Union and MENA. And another question, if is there a synchronizing between Russia and China? the pressure on European geopolitical frontier and the pressure on Taiwan uh, also in South and East China Sea. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor. And we have the chance to, to collect some ideas for discussions for this last part of our uh, webinar <clears throat> and uh, now uh, let's uh, introduce uh, dr alexandro georgescu strategic analyst euro defense romania he is uh, known uh, for his uh, studies articles and those books in he is the working on, on research 
with the uh, Ichi Institute, but also publishing uh, and working in Brussels with uh, different working groups of European Defense Agency, European Space Agency. So maybe you can bring also the perspective from above, uh, Mr. Georges. Thank you so much. You have the floor. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be here and I'd like to congratulate the organizers for such a long running effort that really puts Romania on the map when it comes to Middle Eastern studies and exchanges of ideas. I have a presentation. I will share my screen now. So I would like to continue a bit in the registry of what my predecessors discussed by approaching the issue of the European contribution to Middle East North Africa security from the perspective of critical infrastructure protection. One second. Can you see my screen? And is it moving? Yes, yes, it's okay. Yes, yes. Perfect. So I'd like to discuss a critical infrastructure perspective on EU assistance to the MENA region. So MENA has a very different issues uh, that can be approached also from a critical infrastructure per, uh, perspective, new dimensions of competition and power games, too many competing and conflicting narratives, sub-regional and trans-regional dimensions. We can't seem to agree whether it is a border region, for instance, the North Africa between Europe and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, or is it a buffer region or is it a bridge? and also significant differences resulting from various issues, including uh, attempted block building. Now, critical infrastructure protection provides us uh, an overview of an issue that is vital to the functioning of all societies, especially advanced societies, energy, transport, agriculture, health. And this provides us a systemic perspective on that allows us to analyze both the security environment and also to increase resilience, to increase the protection of those societies. So regional and global infrastructures present special challenges and the MENA area is one such region because it is crisscrossed by uh, global critical infrastructures and also by future projects. And these infrastructures suffer from risks, vulnerabilities and threats, including cascading disruptions. And the greater dependence on critical infrastructures leads to mutual dependencies and new risks, vulnerabilities and threats. The EU is dependent on uh, critical infrastructures which originate or pass through the Middle East and uh, Middle East and North Africa region. And this automatically means that it is affected by the propagation of risks stemming from the region. So critical infrastructure protection is a framework which has been first developed in the United States during the Clinton administration, applied after the 9-11 attacks, which showed that, that the interdependencies between critical infrastructures can, uh, can affect not just the site of a terrorist attack, but also the wider society. So they applied this. Then it was applied by the European Union, uh, starting with 2004, but actually the first directive was in 2008. And it states that a country is only as safe and as prosperous as its infrastructures will allow. And it provides us a comprehensive framework for managing the key infrastructures, assets, and resources on which countries depend at all levels. For instance, uh, Professor Moreshan was kind enough to mention some of my activities. I am a moderator for a working group on the protection of critical energy infrastructures within a consultation forum of the European Defense Agency. So, the protection of critical infrastructures is a very important topic at European level. And the purpose of my presentation today is to show that European Union can provide assistance to the Middle East, North African countries on critical infrastructure issues, and that this framework can address various issues affecting the region, not all of them, of course. It is not a silver bullet for the region. Global networks have become sources of critical systemic threats through domino effects in critical infrastructures, through pandemic spread, through rapid travel and transportation hubs. Uh, so predictability and controllability are important and to promote resilience through backup standards, interaction between stakeholders. And of course the region, while it is a, uh, a very varied region, the Middle East North Africa region also features important transport hubs. So it is affected by a wide range of critical infrastructure issues or issues such as pandemics, which can also be reduced to critical infrastructure issues. We have, a we have seen recently the issue of supply chain risk. 
And uh, the Middle East North Africa region is also affected by supply chain risks lately seen in the pandemic issue and in the context of the fight against the coronavirus pandemic with the uh, with the vaccines and the important materials, but also seen in other regards. So supply chains face a combination of risks. Uh, we are facing infrastructure development. This is very good. And uh, the, uh, the past panelists mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, which will shorten transport times, but increased geographical distance raises new challenges to manage supply chain flows, such as disruption risks and sustainability risks. And risks include unsustainable supply management for emergencies, lack of risk and liability management, unbalanced risks, lack of transparency, and so on. The pandemic highlighted the vulnerability of long logistics chains. And uh, so first you have cuts in the chain and then the inability to keep up with demand. So the MENA region has various critical infrastructure protection priorities. I don't uh, think that this is an exhaustive list. So uh, it wants to have, it needs to have infrastructure security and resilience. It needs to manage risk perceptions and confidence in the authorities. It needs to promote and protect new strategic infrastructure in a challenging environment. It needs to generate business continuity during crisis and also maintain quality of life or improve quality of life, of course. It needs to establish proper regional interconnectors and to manage successful digital transitions. Of course, you can add your own issues here. There are some uh, MENA countries that are heavily dependent on oil revenues and they need to diversify their economies to increase their complexity to produce more added value. And this is again, a critical infrastructure issue. So what are the infrastructure concerns in the area? First, there is no true institutionalized security architecture, although there are attempts at smaller levels like the Gulf Cooperation Council. You have problems with risk perceptions in the area. You have a persistent conflict and uncertainty, aging and attrition in the existing infrastructure, and of course, conflicts related to infrastructure. You have a complexity of existing infrastructures, uneven and unsecured digitalization, geopolitical conflict. And also it is a site for strategic infrastructure development as the aforementioned Belt and Road Initiative. But we can also mention other initiatives that are not necessarily in the media, such as the North-South Transport Corridor, which is supposed to pass through Iran between India and Russia. That is also an example. So what should we take into account? Tangibles and intangibles, long-term interdependencies, key assets, key resources, and perceptions, including perceptions of risk. So what could the EU contribute to this? As mentioned before, the EU has developed a quite extensive system, not only to, to protect critical infrastructures at national level, which is of course mainly the responsibility of the individual states, but it emits recommendations in that regard, but also to protect the European critical infrastructures on which two or more member states are dependent. So the EU has a lot of knowledge about this issue and also has a lot of knowledge on multilateral cooperation for critical infrastructure protection. So firstly, I would state that, that there could be support from the EU or for individual countries from the EU, just like Romania, to implement critical infrastructure protection in the MENA region. And together with Professor Mureșan and with Flavius, over time, we have advanced quite a number of proposals related to the transfer of Romanian expertise in critical infrastructure protection from Romania, from Romanian universities and Romanian think tanks and NGOs and associations to beneficiaries in the Middle East. Romania has had a very successful application of the European directives in this regard, and some of the actions with which countries such as Romania can assist include the assistance for the drafting of documents of reference in critical infrastructure, uh, protection, assistance in setting up continuing education programs for experts and decision makers, knowledge is important of course, contacts for knowledge transfers between counterpart institutions, cooperation for setting up bodies such as interinstitutional working groups, technical secretariats, crisis and emergency management centers, and so on, and also cooperation in the non-governmental sphere, the spheres. For instance, you could have a national critical infrastructure and service protection associations for experts and companies. This is an important component. 
a second uh, a, a second contribution the EU and its countries could make, but especially the EU, would be to expand the European program for critical infrastructure protection to encompass non-EU countries in the MENA region. Right now, the uh, the EPCHIP program basically applies to member states, and it states that a European critical infrastructure affects two or more member states. But there are also European critical infrastructures with a component outside the territory of the EU. So it is important, it is a possible vector to have a cooperation with these third countries, whether they are in the east of Europe or in the south of Europe or in the south uh, east of Europe, to cooperate with them, to transfer know-how and to also include them in this management of uh, the critical infrastructures on which Europe itself is reliant. You'll notice that I am speaking here not just of the interest of the countries in the MENA region, but also the self-interest of the EU in promoting the resilience of critical infrastructures on which it is now dependent and will also be dependent in the future. And this would involve this type of cooperation, would involve helping them identify these infrastructures, helping them uh, create a regulatory and administrative framework to protect them, transferring knowledge, a lot of the components mentioned before, but also national contact points, security liaison officers, appropriate exchange of information during crises. All of these are very important. And there are even infrastructures in this regard, such as the critical infrastructure, early warning network, information network, that the EU has set up, which could be extended to MENA countries. And in, we can see that now, in the beginning, the European Critical Infrastructure Protection Program only involved energy and transport. But starting in December 2020, there have been new proposals, which have not yet been implemented, that recognize that uh, there are more interdependencies, there are more types of critical infrastructures which have a trans-regional, trans-border effect. So it is now going to implement something related to, maybe in this variant or another variant, the Critical Entities Resilience Directive, which also includes includes health, uh, financial market infrastructure, drinking water, digital infrastructure, public administration. So all of these are potential areas for cooperation on critical infrastructures between the EU and the countries in the Middle East and North Africa region. Basically, my first proposal was related to the, uh, to the various infrastructures that could be detected at national levels in these countries, but also a proposal, this the second proposal, to include, when it comes to transborder infrastructure, to include the governance of the security of these infrastructures in the European program. And my third and last proposal is to initiate a Mediterranean macro regional strategy for the EU. Macro regions are a new level of governance in the EU that relies that rely on functional areas defined by geography, by common challenges, by in existing industrial chains, by existing history and so on, to address common challenges. And they include not only European countries, but also non-EU countries. Um, and this, this sort of, uh, of arrangement has proven successful in the past with regards, for instance, to the European Union Baltic strategy. I think that the Mediterranean macro regional strategy or maybe uh, a variant like a West Mediterranean strategy and an East Mediterranean strategy in which EU countries can cooperate directly with non-EU countries in the Middle East and North Africa region could have a significant uh, benefit in terms of uh, channeling and arranging EU efforts in the region to improve security for all and also to improve cooperation on economics, environmental protection and other issues. So this is an example, the Danube strategy, which was initiated by Romania and Austria. It includes not only European Union countries, but also non-EU countries. For instance, Croatia was not in the EU when uh, the Danube strategy was, uh, was first announced, and it includes also Balkan countries, uh, the Republic of Moldova, and parts of, uh, of Ukraine. Why? Because it's related to the catchment area of the Danube River. Now, such a uh, model could also be applied in the West Mediterranean or the East Mediterranean or the whole Mediterranean. And you can see the pillars of existing strategies connecting the region. So uh, mobility and multimodality, sustainable energy, culture and tourism, people to people, protecting the environment, building prosperity, and also strengthening the region where an infrastructure protection element could be introduced. So, and the 
EU already has experience in this macro regional cooperation. Not all of the elements have functioned so far. The Baltic strategy was a much greater success than the Danube strategy, for instance. But I think this is a model which the European Union could use to organize its uh, influence, uh, to organize its um, efforts in the region. So in lieu of conclusions, I would like to summarize this way. Firstly, we need to look at a lot of the problems in the MENA region as being critical infrastructure problems related either to health, energy, uh, public administration, and so on. The EU can offer direct assistance in this regard for the protection of critical infrastructures, which are a target for hybrid threats. And it can, and uh, this, uh, during this presentation, I also advanced three proposals, concrete proposals for how the EU and member states such as Romania could assist countries in the MENA region to implement critical infrastructure protection programs, not only to their benefits, but to the direct benefit of the EU as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um... Now we uh, having the maps and uh, this uh, clear presentation of ideas. Uh, these are also invitation for the final discussion. We have a last uh, speaker from our session, which is uh, our colleague uh, uh, Professor Sergio Dur. No, Doctor. Yes. He can Sergio Dur from University Babes Way from Cluj. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mureshan. It's a great pleasure for me to take part in this event. I'm going to talk uh, about the European Union's foreign policy regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, the main idea of my presentation is that in the last couple of years, EU failed in contributing uh, proactively to the revival of the Middle East peace process because of its strategic paralysis regarding this issue and its obsession with the out-of-date Oslo paradigm. As a consequence, EU needs a new approach in relation to this conflict. These are the three main points I'm going to tackle in, uh, in my uh, presentation. The first one, the root causes of EU strategic passivity or paralysis. Uh, we have two, two, uh, two roots, two causes. Lack of unity is the first of them. Uh, EU member states hardly speak on a single voice when it comes to the, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this issue divided EU in three camps. We have a pro-Israeli camp uh, formed mainly around uh, Hungary and Poland. We have a pro-Palestinian camp, which includes uh, Sweden, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And we have a relatively neutral camp formed around France. Moreover, Israel undermines EU consensus by engaging with individual states rather than with EU as a single entity. And Israel benefits from its cross relationship it has with the four Central European uh, uh, states that make up the Visegrad group, and I mean Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and, uh, and Poland. Uh, these internal divisions uh, tie EU's hands because in the foreign uh, affairs field, EU expresses and adopts positions mainly based on consensus. And these divisions uh, limit EU's credibility and capacity to act, and uh, they represent an opportunity for the Israeli and Palestinian lobby groups. The second uh, cause here uh, is that EU is more comfortable uh, with allowing US to lead the diplomatic initiatives regarding this issue, and also EU has um, little to say in order uh, in other international formats, uh, like, for example, like the Middle East Quartet or the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee. So because of this self-imposed secondary role and its lack of unity, EU is unable to use sanctions leverage against Israel for violating international law. Also, EU, is also, uh, EU lacks uh, political will to constrain the Palestinian leaders to act in accordance with democracy and the rule of law. In fact, in the last years, the Palestinian elite ignored EU calls for democracy, rule of law, and accountability. And the truth is, sorry, oh, the truth is that in the, um, EU became, after the, Arab, the so-called Arab Spring, EU became more risk averse and reserved in demanding structural reforms. And since then, EU is more concerned with stability and countering the, the rise of Islamist groups than in good governance. Um, second point of my presentation, another, another short, shortcoming of the EU approach is that EU is stuck in the logic of the Oslo Accords. Uh, the cornerstone of EU policy are uh, the Palestinian rights 
to self-determination and the negotiated two-state solution. The problem is that EU promotes these objectives through the Oslo Agreement's paradigm, but the reality on the ground uh, shows uh, shows us that this approach is out of date. Why? Because it fails to freeze the status quo. And in the last uh, two decades, Israeli settlements and infrastructure connecting them spurred, which will lead uh, to a future fragmented Palestinian state. Uh, uh, this also paradig paradigm also led to an absolute Israeli control over Palestinian life. On the other side, uh, there is another obstacle for, uh, for the United Palestine, which is this rivalry between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, having this in mind, you should, you should realize that uh, its three main objectives, like peacemaking, uh, two-state solution, and peace state building, are out of reach in the near future. As a consequence, EU should ramp up its efforts to devise a new paradigm. And uh, European scholars and experts on this issue called on the EU to rethink its approach in accordance with the current realities on the ground. And they have proposed an approach based on the following five lines. The first one, discouraging Israel for building new settlements in West Bank by using economic and political tools, insisting for direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations for a two-state solution. EU observers and scholars on this issue have argued that EU should give Israeli decision makers a choice to commit to negotiations for a two-state solution or to give to the Palestinian people equal rights in one democratic state. Regarding the Palestinian leaders, EU should give them a choice to implement reforms in the line with democratic rule of law and good governance principles or losing US economic, political and diplomatic support. EU also should take efforts to bridge the gap between all Palestinian political factions. The four, uh, point number four, EU should try to become an equal partner uh, to uh, the US in this, uh, in this matter. And the last point, uh, you should engage with the Arab world with realistic expectations. The European Union should be realistic and recognize that the Abraham Accord will not bring dividends for the Palestinian cause. And this normalization and formalization of the relations between Israel and the four Arab states happened last year did not lead uh, to any progress, neither to the peace progress nor to the Palestinian lives. And these normalizations confirm that the Palestinian issue is no more a driving force in the region because it broke a long-standing taboo in the Arab world. Uh, this was that the Arab states will recognize Israel in return for making meaningful political compromises vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians. And uh, basically the last point, uh, EU should, uh, European Union have, should have this aspect in mind when engaging with regional actors on this uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and comments in the Q&A session. Uh, I wish you all the success in your studies and uh, uh, yes, it's right, uh, Palestinian uh, topic uh, deserves a special discussion, only it is difficult in uh, some minutes to tackle such a sensitive issue. Uh, but in any case, it's good that we had in our, in our uh, broad view also this uh, uh, this topic. Now, uh, uh, I'm uh, here very pleased that I see also Minister uh, uh, Severin. We have other people which I'm sure our guests which want to make some comments, uh, some to answer to some questions. We have here a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, problems. We raised a lot of problems here. Uh, by the foreign guests and by also by the Romanian speakers. So uh, what we can do in, in the European Union with, with the MENA region, we have this very sensitive now uh, topic of uh, migrants. Migrants, and it's not only like Professor Nasher mentioned by, by, by Belarus, it's a third direction for these migrants coming to Europe, or be pushed to Europe. We had first uh, from, from Turkey towards uh, Greece and uh, Central Europe to Western Europe. Then we had now the couloir from South, from, from Northern part of Africa, that means uh, Libya mainly going uh, toward Italy and so on. And now we have the third uh, 
a couloir which is uh, uh, under negotiation to find a, a humanitarian solution for this uh, new reality. So, um, please, who wants to take the floor? Minister uh, Severin, I have seen you Major. in a certain moment. He no, is not here. He is not here in this very moment. But any case, uh, uh, we uh, started to speak about uh, China intensive uh, in Middle East. Uh, he uh, much more about China as about the European Union, and then uh, it's it's uh, it's a reality. We have to be more active and to more uh, uh, with more innovative ideas. Uh, gateway is a project uh, now developed by European Union. Uh, we don't need, uh, we have too many gateways here uh, after uh, 2015 here in Europe. So uh, better to, to think to a project uh, which is uh, able to develop and to enforce this uh, problematic like it was presented by Dr. Alexander Georgescu about infrastructures. Infrastructures which are key for preserving the, the security of the countries, to link the countries, to enforce uh, the network, to make a resilience from all these networks of, of railroads, uh, of, of uh, roads, uh, and, and uh, what we have here around in, in Europe. So uh, please, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, interested to take the floor, Professor Nakshu, you have mentioned there uh, some uh, connections about uh, about uh, north south yes it's uh, interesting uh, uh, if i'm not wrong it was six years ago when it started the discussion dr alexander maybe he is remembering when uh, we published an article in, in limes in italy about the three cc initiative and we have the black. We have the Danube strategy going toward uh, Black Sea. We have this three uh, C's initiative, but we have also this uh, uh, package of, of uh, initiatives uh, in uh, the framework of uh, Belt and Road. So a lot of uh, initiatives, uh, and uh, we discovered that some of the projects could not be put in practice due to the lack of manpower. Money, you can find the money sometimes, but sometimes you don't have the manpower. So, and uh, speaking about, uh, about uh, geopolitical axis, we have to look uh, carefully about the uh, a new uh, geopolitical axis developed by Russia. It, it was, it seems, the initiative of uh, President Putin, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea. So they introduced they introduce uh, uh, Caspian Sea in this uh, framework. You remember that uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> from uh, <coughs> Caspian Sea, it was an attack <coughs> with missiles on uh, from uh, from uh, the ships from from Caspian Sea on, on, on in Syria. It was a transportation of uh, uh, military equipment over the rivers from Caspian Sea in the Black Sea and so on. So it's, it's uh, sensitive. Uh, things is that are much more complicated. So please, who wants to take the floor? It was uh, not mentioned the problematic of uh, Ukraine and Turkey, speaking about the Black Sea, uh, it was not mentioned the North uh, uh, Atlantic Alliance, which is uh, present here. In, in, oh yeah, sorry, I, I mentioned something about, no, 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 something wrong, no, no, not yet, okay. So um, in, uh, in this respect, uh, we have to take care about this, all these developments. Um, we don't know exactly the Black Sea. Uh, we have here countries, members of NATO, like, like Turkey, which is interested to go to 
also to, to join Shanghai Cooperation Organization, like it was mentioned at the very beginning of the conference by Minister Merishkano, an important uh, construction. Uh, we have the <clears throat> problematic of, of Ukraine, which is our neighbor, but uh, also a country which is in, in, in a very uh, difficult uh, situation, and uh, we hope to have a so a diplomatic solution in, in relations with Russia, and so on. So uh, not only Middle East, uh, it's uh, also our region, which is quite complicated. And about the developments uh, we have seen in, in uh, presented by Dr. Alexander Georgescu is a map uh, in Central Europe and the Southern part uh, of Europe, Eastern part of Mediterranean, we have not to forget that uh, a lot of uh, ideas are coming uh, also from, from Chinese uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, China have a control, if I'm not wrong, about 10% of the harbors uh, in Mediterranean. Uh, and then uh, also they are interested to, to go further in Europe. Uh, we have to see which are the opportunities, which are the challenges in this cooperation with China. So, please, silence. Silence. So, you, you can. Uh, may, I inter may I have an intervention, Mr. Borishan? A peaceful intervention, please. Surely, 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 of course. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned, Mr. Morishan, I think in, uh, regarding the EU relation and MENA countries, I think the, as uh, many participants from early morning till now emphasize the importance of energy. As you know, EU and European countries if they would like uh, sufficient or uh, let's say uh, uh, fundamental autonomy, they need to have good resources of energy. And as we know in last time, uh, you know how is the challenges with the gas between uh, Russia and European countries especially some country in Est. I remember two decades ago, when we discussed about some pipeline of energy between Iran and European countries, many people are emphasized such as the project are not, are not uh, feasible. But today, you know, you see or you feel the domination of Russia in uh, sending or exporting energy, especially gas to EU. And because of the domination, they have the possibility to increase the price in one month, two or three times. And EU has no any uh, possibility to challenge such as uh, difficulty. I think this is the uh, one important issue that we should work on that more. Another thing I think it is very important regarding the uh, EU relation and MENA country is generally when uh, we are speaking or people, when they are speaking about the EU relation with MENA countries, they have, they receive some voices from uh, three, three important EU countries, Germany, France, Italy, and of course, uh, before it was in UK. I think it is necessary to have more voices, more strong voices from other EU countries. EU has 27, 28 uh, members, but generally the voices are concentrated in two or three or four, five states. I think it is uh, in the interest of countries like Romania, Poland, Hungary uh, to have more voices 
in EU regarding the relation of EU with uh, many countries, especially Iran, that has had a very uh, strong and close relation with the uh, uh, new EU member country. You know, uh, all of uh, you knows very well the relation between Iran and uh, Romania in 88 was more or reached more than 1 billion euros. That mean there are a good capacity, but no, we are, we are uh, feeling uh, uh, coming up, down, such as uh, uh, things. Uh, because uh, our uh, potential, I think it is necessary uh, to work more on such as things because such as uh, cooperation between uh, Romania and country in the central and uh, Eastern Europe is in interest of our nation and uh, will be uh, benefit in, uh, in the process of development of uh, trade, and of course, in all different uh, sectors. Uh, and regarding the Black Sea, we know this is a very important issue. Uh, all of knows, um, all of uh, us, uh, we know from beginning of third millennium, US began a special program to have uh, significant presence in the Black Sea and know we see a very, uh, let's say, competi high competi between the uh, country behind the Black Sea as a, uh, having more uh, military capacity in this uh, important region. Uh, I think uh, it is very important and we have the possibility to cooperate in this manner between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea in the field of energy transit and uh, combating terrorism and migration. Thank okay. you again for uh, your attention, you. your kind attention. Thank you. So uh, we are now uh, before the last session.